وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته as always, we begin by praising Allah Azza wa Jal and we begin by asking Allah to exalt the mention of Grand Peace to our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to his family and his companions. We've reached the topic of the marriage contract itself. The actual, the aqd, the agreement, the terms and the conditions, if you like. And like they tell you about any contract, you should always read the small print. You should always read the terms and conditions. So in this episode, inshallah, we're just going to give you an overview of the aqt. What are these, you know, these two people who came together as a husband and wife? On what basis did they come together? What's the small print? What are the terms and conditions in the contract? That's what we're going to cover in this episode. Bi idni al kari. So we're going to start by the, describing the fact that marriage is an aqt. It is an agreement and it's a contract. And that's why it's called aqtun nikah. The contract of marriage. And then nikah, the word nikah, because we covered the word zawaj earlier. The word nikah in the language is used for two things. It's used for, for a contract of marriage and it's also used for marital intimacy, i.e. intimate relations between husband and wife. Both of these are called nikah. Like in the hadith of Anas in Sahih Muslim, in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Isna'u kulla shay'in illa nikah. When he talked about a woman who is on her menses and how her husband should interact with her, he said, do everything with her except nikah, I accept uh, intimacy or an act of intimacy, I uh, intimate relations between husband and wife. So a nikah, it either means intimate relations or it means the actual marriage itself. And we already mentioned a brief definition. There are many definitions that scholars give, but just one definition. They said, aqtun yufidu hal istimta'i that it is a contract which allows the permissibility of intimacy between the two parties, i.e. the husband and the wife, with each other in the way that Islam has permitted. So it's a contract. And a contract comes under al uh, muamalat in Islam, right? It comes under the topic of muamalat. It comes under the topic of... Uh, the interactions and agreements that we make with people. So it has terms and it has uh, conditions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, called it an aqt. In Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number uh, 237, Allah azza wa jal, he said, وَإِن طَلَّقْتُمُوهُنَّ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تَمَسُّوهُنَّ وَقَدْ فَرَضْتُمْ لَهُنَّ فَرِيضَةً فَنِصْفُ مَا فَرَضْتُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يَعْفُونَ أَوْ يَعْفُ وَالَّذِي بِيَدِهِ عُقْدَةُ النِّكَاحِ وَأَنْ تَعْفُوا أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَنْسَوُ الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ Allah Azza wa Jal said, and if you divorce them before you have touched them, I, before you have been intimate with them or before you have been alone, as some of the scholars said, alone privately in a situation of intimacy with them. And you had declared for them their farida, their mahr. Then give them half of what you had declared unless they forgive it. They let it go. They pardon it and let it go. Or the one whose hand, the uqtatun nikah, the aqt of the nikah, the nikah contract is in. And for you to, for the men to let it go and give them the whole amount is closer to taqwa. And don't forget the grace that is between you and Allah is all seeing of what you do. But here I just wanted to clarify that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he called it uqtatun nikah. And some of the scholars of tafsir, when they came to the word uqtatun nikah, they said it means aqt an nikah. It means the, the contract of marriage. And that the contract of marriage is in the hands of the man. And that means that the man is the one who has to, we're going to talk about the conditions of the contract that has to enter into it. And the man has the ability uh, unilaterally, if that's the right word, on his own to exit that contract. As for the woman we talk about in Shoes, what 
talaq and khula and things like that. She has the ability to exit that contract, but it's not unilateral. In other words, she can't do it by herself with the support of anybody else. She needs an imam or a judge, a qadi, someone in that position to do that for her. Instead, or, or at least to support her in doing that, the husband is in his hands. Uqtatun nikah, the act of an nikah the contract of the nikah. So Allah Azza wa Jal called it an aqt. But that's not the only thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, called uh, this in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 21, He said, وَكَيْفَ تَأْخُذُونَهُ وَقَدْ أَفْضَى بَعْضُكُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ وَأَخَذْنَ مِنْكُمْ مِثَاقًا غَلِظًا How can you take it back, ayah the mahr, from them when you have been intimate with one another and you have taken, or they have taken from you مِثَاقًا غَلِظَ A weighty covenant A weighty covenant So Allah called it an aqt عُقْتَةُ nikah, And Allah called it a mithaq A covenant So a covenant seems like I've got some, some serious things I've agreed to A weighty promise I promise You know like, you know when the Christians uh, get married and they have that whole thing like that they say to have and to hold and to cherish and all that stuff until death do us part and whatever. Like, it's a covenant, it's like that, right? It's like you've made a, a, a promise that is more than a promise. It's more than a contract. It's a covenant. You've taken something on board as an amana, as a responsibility, and you've pledged a pledge, a mithaq, that you are going to stick to that responsibility. So what is this pledge that you had agreed to? What is this covenant? Uh, what is this thing that you said that you are going to stick to no matter what? Ibn Jarir, he mentioned a number of different opinions. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, the great scholar of tafsir, the imam of the scholars of tafsir, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. One of the opinions he mentioned it is, imsakum bi ma'roof aw tasrihum bi ihsan. That the pledge the Muslim makes is all to have and to hold and till death to his part and all that stuff. That's not what the Muslim pledge is. That's not the mithaq of the Muslim. The mithaq of the Muslim is imsaakum bi ma'roof aw tasrihum bi ihsan. Either I will keep that lady in the best possible way or I will let her go in a beautiful and excellent way. Meaning if she stays with me, I will treat her with ma'roof in a good way. And ma'roof can also be in the way that is she would expect from me, that people would expect from me. That can also be ma'roof can have two meanings. It can be uh, good, ta'muruna bil ma'roof, you command that which is good. And it can also be al-urf, that which is customary and, and that which is expected. So I will, when I keep her with me, I'm going to keep her in a way that is good. And if I ever let her go, I'm going to let her go with ihsan in an even better way than she would expect from me. Because sometimes marriages break apart. That happens. Sometimes marriages break apart and divorce is not something in Islam that is haram absolute, in an absolute sense. Rather, at the end of the day, sometimes marriages break apart. But the husband, he pledges, his mithaq is, when I keep you, I'm going to keep you in the best way. And if I let you go, I'm going to let you go with ihsan in the kindest, most excellent way that exceeds the expectations. Some of them said the mithaq is the aqt itself. Some of them said Ibn Jarir mentioned al-aqt, the nikah itself. The, the, he makes the mithaq is the aqt of the nikah, where he says, I accept. And he takes her as a wife, that that's the mithaq. And uh, some of them mentioned that it is akhatumuhunna bi amanillah wa stahlaltum furujahunna bi kalimatillah. We had mentioned this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned in the uh, in the khutbah that he gave, or one of the khutab, one of the khutbahs that he gave in the farewell hajj, that he says, you have taken those women as a responsibility from Allah, as an amana in the sight of Allah. And their private parts have become halal for you by the words of Allah, I, by the commands of Allah, the words of Allah that were revealed in the Qur'an, the statement of Allah, the speech of Allah in the Qur'an, and what the Prophet ﷺ conveyed from Allah in the Sunnah that has made marriage permissible between the, the husband and the wife and made intimacy permissible between the husband and the wife. You've taken them with the amana. They said the mithaq is that the husband says, I take you as an amana in the sight of Allah. That's a very weighty mithaq and ghalidah. It's a heavy oath. 
just for the husband to say that I have taken you as a wife, as an amana from Allah. I've taken you as an amana from Allah. That's one of the opinions that Ibn Jarir, he mentioned. And in the end of the day, there is no reason why all of these opinions cannot be taken. So the husband is not, you know, we don't have any of this to have and to hold and to love and to whatever, cherish until death do us part and whatever else the Christians say. Our mithaq, our covenant is that we, if we keep our wife as a wife, we're going to keep her bil ma'roof in the best possible way. And if we let her go, we're going to let her go in the best possible way. We agree to the conditions of the nikah and the rights that are implied by it. And we have taken her as an amana in the sight of Allah. That's what it means when we say mithaqan ghalidha, a weighty covenant in the sight of Allah. Because not an amana from, you know, Ahmed or Muhammad. It's not even an amana from her father. It's an amana from Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's enough to make any man, any man scared. As for uh, this uh, keeping her in a good way, this is found in Surah Al-Baqarah in ayah number 229. Allah Azza wa Jal said, divorce is two times. This is within the ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah talk about divorce. Either you keep her in a good way, bil ma'roof, in, in the best way. And in a way that is, you know, according to the urf, i.e. according to the custom and the expectations. Or you let her go in the best of ways, with ihsan, with the kindest of ways you let her go. So that's just the reference for the statement that was mentioned by Ibn Jarir, rahimullah ta'ala, from a number of the salaf with regard to what the meaning is, mithaqan ghalidha, mithaqan uh, ghalidha. Also in uh, Surah An-Nisa, Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, وَعَشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ فَإِنْ كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَاءً أَنْ تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah Azza wa Jal said at the end of the ayah, uh, وَعَشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Live with your wives بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And again, بِالْمَعْرُوفِ it can mean with good, live with them in a good way. Or it can be live with them in accordance to what the expectations are and the norms are. And some of the scholars said this is the most uh, generic and general and comprehensive description of how a man has to be in the marriage contract, in, in the marriage with his wife. Everything that is said about how a husband behaves towards his wife can be summarized by the statement of Allah. Ma'ruf, live together with them in the best way. Live with them in the best way. That's what the husband has to do. That's what he's doing when he, that's what he's taking on board. That's his amana that he's taking on board in the sight of Allah. And that's all of the rights of the wife can be summarized. Live with them in the best way and uh, in a way that is, again, we said according to what the customs, the norms, and the expectations are. And if you dislike them, then perhaps you dislike something and Allah puts in it a great deal of good. And how many times is that true? That a person dislikes something uh, and thinks it's not good for them, but Allah puts in it a great deal of good. And we mentioned a hadith earlier on regarding one of the female companions. And she was she had asked the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Inkahi Usama ibn Zayd, marry Usama bin Zayd, radiallahu anhum. May Allah be pleased with them all. And uh, she said, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't like it. I didn't, I wasn't happy with it. And then the Prophet ﷺ told her to obey and she married him and she said, Allah put in it khayrah. Allah put in it so much good for me. So in terms of this contract, how does this contract work? Well, this contract has pillars, it has arkan. And arkan are the things which, if you don't have them, the contract doesn't exist at all. It's completely false from its, you know, from the, from the bottom, from the base of it, the foundation of it is false. It has to have three essential things for this contract to be. The first is wujud az zawjain bila mawani'. That, and I'm just making this summarize, instead of bringing you the whole definition, just summarize it, that you have the two spouses without 
any Islamic reason why they can't get married. What would be an Islamic reason why they can't get married? Kufr, for example, disbelief, that one of them was a disbeliever. Uh, Allahumma, unless the exception of marrying the Kitabiya, the woman from Ahl Kitab, and that is something that we're not going to dwell on too much here. I would just simply say that I would not advise it at this time unless it is a necessity for a person because the situation is that there's a lot of issues over children. There's a lot of issues over divorce. There's a lot of issues over so many things with marrying the Kitabiyat. Uh, and it's better for a man to marry a Muslim woman rather than look into the Kitabiyya. But it could be necessary for some people like the revert who accepted Islam and his wife is still Christian. He can stay married to her for example, uh, that might be something to think about. But generally, kufr is one of the mawani' uh, that that uh, the husband is not a Muslim or the wife is not a Muslim, as I said, with exception of Ahl Kitab for the, the hus Muslim husband who marries a kitabi, a, a, a wife who is a Jew or a Christian. Uh, for example, nesab could be a mani' like there could be some uh, relation between them that makes them, uh, that, that means that they can't get married. Um, like the close family members that can't marry and things like that. Uh, mahramiya could be a, a mani' like they could be a mahram for one another so they can't marry. Um, that's not only down to blood ties, it could be other reasons. And also uh, ties of breastfeeding as well because breastfeeding establishes the same ties that the blood ties that are established by blood. So therefore it could be that the that those are all different reasons why the couple can't get married. And if those reasons are uncovered later on, the marriage is instantly invalid. So someone comes and says, I didn't realize I married a woman, and I didn't realize that uh, her and I, or th that, uh, that uh, she and I had uh, been fed, uh, breastfed by the same woman. We didn't know that. Instantly the marriage is invalidated. And likewise, kufr, and, and you might say, SubhanAllah, how could a woman not know that her husband was not a Muslim? But it can happen. And I've seen personally seen cases like this, where the woman married and the husband said, yeah, I'm a Muslim. And maybe the wali didn't really check it out as much as he should have done. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm going to convert and whatever. And uh, when you speak to him, he says, no, I don't have anything to do with Islam. I just said that to become Muslim. Or I just said that for the sake of you know, converting. So here you talk to him, you give him a chance to understand Islam, you tell him, but if he continues to say, I'm not a Muslim and I just said it for the sake of getting married, then this marriage is not valid. So you've got to have two spouses that are compatible with each other. Uh, you have to have uh, Al-Ijab and Al-Qabul. You have to have uh, Ijab, which is the offering. And the offering is made by the wali of the bride. Now we say the wali, usually the wali is the father in almost all situations, but there are some situations if her father is not a Muslim, or perhaps he passed away, where there might be another wali. So the wali of the bride, the guardian of the bride, offers her in marriage to her, her future husband. He says, for example, I offer you so my daughter so-and-so in marriage. I offer you my daughter so-and-so in marriage. And the third pillar is that the husband says, the, the husband-to-be, the groom, he says, I accept. He says, I accept or I accept your offer and so on, or words to that effect. So those are the three sort of pillars that it's based upon. As for conditions, that things that have to be in place, it has to be clear who the two spouses are. You know, it can't be anything like, I married you to my daughter and he's got four daughters that are unmarried. So we don't know which of the four he's married to. And subhanAllah, in some cultures, this happens. Uh, I personally never come across anything like this, but I've seen cultures where it is the case that a man thinks he's marrying one daughter and on the wedding day, he found out that he married another daughter, the other daughter. So he, there's no ta'een as zawjain, the, the, the spouses are not known. Or I married you to, you know, Abu Fulan. Who is Abu Fulan? Abu Fulan, who is he? You know, which one? Where, you know, like so, or Um Fulan, or whatever it is, you know, like so, the, the husband, the wife, they're not under, it's not clear who the two of them are. Like, I offer you, and there's like four people standing there, and he says, I offer you. You know, it, it has to be clear who is the husband, who is the wife. Whatever way you make them clear, 
you know, they mention their full name or either, you know, there's only two of them there and it's point to one and the other, but it's it's got to be clear who the two spouses are. Another condition is Rida Zawji, the two spouses must be content to marry. There's no such thing as forced marriages in Islam. We don't have forced marriages in Islam. We haven't had forced marriages. The Prophet Sallallahu annulled them from the beginning. And that's a big misconception about Islam. And in Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Abi Huraira, أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا تنكح الأيام حتى تستأمر ولا تنكح البكر حتى تستأذن قالوا يا رسول الله وكيف إذنها قال أن تسكت أبي هريرة narrated from the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم that he said that the previously married woman should not be married again like as in should not ha have her marriage contract done again until she commands for it she, she, she says for it to happen. Nor should the virgin girl have her marriage done unless her permission is sought. They said, O Messenger of Allah, how is her permission sought? He said that she is silent, meaning that she doesn't say no. The father comes and says uh, that I'm, I've decided or that uh, we've agreed finally with the husband and whatever, the groom, that this is going to be the marriage. Are you content with that? You're happy to go ahead? Either she says yes or either she remains silent. But she doesn't say no or she doesn't say that I'm not happy, I don't want to marry that person. And we have an, an example of this and it is narrated in uh, Ibn Majah, Sunan Ibn Majah. An Buraida ibn al-Husayb radiyallahu an qal jaat fatatun ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqalat inna abi zawwajan abna akhi liyarfa'a bi khasisata. She said, or Buraida, he said, radiallahu anh, that a young girl, a young woman, she came to the Prophet وسلم, and she said, my father has married me off to my cousin to raise his status. I, against my will. He's forced me to marry my cousin against my will. فَجَعَلَ الْأَمْرَ إِلَيْهَا فَقَالَتْ قَدْ أَجَزْتُ مَا صَنَعَ أَبِي وَلَكِنْ أَرَدْتُ أَنْ تَعْلَمَ النِّسَاءُ أَنْ لَيْسَ إِلَى الْآبَاءِ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٍ she said, or the Prophet ﷺ, he gave her a choice. And this is wallah, from the wisdom of Islam. It's so beautiful. She got married, she was forced to marry. The Prophet ﷺ didn't dissolve the marriage and say, okay, now you're divorced. Now not only did you get forced into marriage, you're also a divorcee. You got forced into marriage and you're a divorcee. He gave her a choice. What do you want to do? Do you want to, if you want to stay with that man, you can stay with him. And if you want to divorce him, I can break up the marriage. She said, I am okay with what my dad did. I've allowed what my dad did. But I wanted the women to know that fathers don't have a right to do this thing. That's as roughly as I can translate it. That fathers don't have control. The matter is not in their hands. It's not the matter that they have the right to decide. So it's a beautiful hadith explaining that you have to have both the husband and the wife have to be happy. And if it's the case that the wife is not happy or the, the, the bride is not happy and she's forced into it without her permission, then in this case, she has a choice either to stay in the marriage or either to leave the marriage and it's entirely up to her. The next condition that we have is the presence of the wali. And as we said, the wali, generally speaking, fil asl or aslan, it is the father. That's that the father has the right to give his daughter away in marriage. However, there are times when it might not be the father, the father passed away or the father has some reason why he can't be the wali. Like for example, he's not a Muslim. Uh, and of course, it's not allowed for a non-Muslim to have authority over a Muslim. I, it's not allowed for a non-Muslim father to decide for his daughter or to give his daughter away in marriage because that's a kind of authority and it's not allowed for him as a non-Muslim to have that authority over his daughter who is a Muslim. So the wali usually is the father. In some cases, it might be another relative. In some cases, it might be the Muslim judge or the Muslim imam. It could be that's in different cases. But this also, this issue of just randomly choosing a wali is not something praiseworthy. You know, like some of the revert sisters and they just say like, I just choose my wali. That's not the way the wali works. The wali is the father. If the father is not suitable, then it goes to the qadi, to the judge. And the judge chooses who the wali should be. Either he takes it himself or either he appoints your brother, your uh, 
you know, your uh, uncle uh, Fulan, the owner of this place, the 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 yani the Imam of the Masjid, he will appoint somebody. But it's not for the woman to say, "Oh, I've chosen this guy as the wali," and then the next yani two weeks later she marries him. And it's, this is like fawda, it's complete chaos, this issue of choosing the wali. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, He said, whichever woman she marries without the permission of her wali, her nikah is Batil is completely uh, invalid. Her nikah is invalid. Her nikah is invalid. And the hadith is narrated in Jami' at Tirmidhi and in other places with different wordings. It's also a requirement for the contract to have two witnesses. Uh, and that's because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Al-Tabarani, لا نكاح إلا بولي وشاهدين There is no nikah except with the wali and two witnesses. Those two witnesses are obviously uh, two male Muslim witnesses above the age of puberty who are people of religion and people of honor and uh, يعني, who are trusted in their witness. And also, and some of the scholars made this a condition and it's safer to make it a condition and even though some of the scholars didn't say it's a condition, like in it's, it's safer to consider this at least highly recommended, if not a condition, is a statement of the Prophet nikah, Announce the marriage, and that's in Musnad Imam Ahmed. Announce the marriage. In other words, that the marriage isn't done in secret. And Shaykh al-Islam Muntaymiyyah, ta'ala, he considered this to be so important that it can even come above the shahidain, above the two witnesses. Yani, because at the end of the day, if you announce it, then it takes the place of that. But here, I think that we bring all of them together. We bring the two witnesses and we announce the marriage. And it's safer to consider that a condition or a highly, highly recommended uh, action that should not be uh, that should not be gone aside from Allahumma unless the person is unable to announce it, i.e. because they uh, uh, they got married, uh, let's say, on a journey and they were not able to announce it to everybody. But this idea of secret marriages and this guy's been married to a woman for 10 years, nobody knows that he married. It's not appropriate. And in the opinion of some of the ulama, it puts a great doubt upon the validity of the marriage or, or at least it's extremely, extremely dislike for a person to do that. So I consider this to be very serious that the i'lan should be done, the nikah should be announced. Now, some people might be asking about the mahar. And as for the mahar, the mahar is not the necessarily uh, part of the conditions, meaning if the mahar is not mentioned, the nikah is still valid. Uh, and the mahar just becomes the mahar, which is normal or customary for a woman of that status in that kind of place. But Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَآتُ النِّسَاءَ صَدُقَاتِهِنَّ نِحْلَةً فَإِنْ طِبْنَ لَكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ مِّنْهُ نَفْسًا فَكُلُوهُ هَنِئًا مَرِئًا Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 4. Give the women their mahar, their, their uh, sadaqatihinna, their sadaq, their mahar, nihla. فَإِنْ طِبْنَ لَكُمْ And if they are uh, happy, with, if they are happy to give you some, or they're happy to share some, or spend some on something for you, uh, with طيب النفس any like they're totally like content it's not forced it's not like pushed for them and they said yeah like they had some of the mahar and they gave it to to the help the husband with something then the husband is allowed to take it honey and Mary are without any concerns or any worries so that is the obligation of giving the mahar but it's not a condition of the nikah meaning if it's not given it just goes to mahar al mithil it just goes to the mahar of what is customary for a woman of that kind of uh, status in that kind of uh, place. As for the things which are recommended in the contract, then we have uh, the khutbah al haja and that is something that I would like to take in the next episode, inshallah ta'ala, to go through with you and translate and take some of the benefits from, because that khutbah al haja has a lot of benefits in it as it relates to the nikah, and we can look at it from the point of view of the nikah, inshallah ta'ala. That's coming up in the next episode. And that's what Allah made easy for me to mention. And Allah knows best. Wa salatu wa salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.